Outside of that, we're going to kick off a new series today, so let's pray together, and we're going to get into God's Word. Jesus, thank you for today, and thank you for what you're going to do in and through our lives in this series, God, and I just pray, I just pray, God, for really breakthroughs, because Lord, I know in so many of our lives, God, when it comes to prayer, we struggle, and we, we, we just don't know how to pray better and i just pray that really through this series we would awaken to what you desire for our lives in prayer and so draw us close to your heart and i pray you would teach us your will and your ways in jesus name amen like i said we're actually starting a new series where we're going to be looking through the prayers in the Bible. Uh, I, I kind of said this at the close of last week's service. Uh, technically, I've never done this before, but I've, I've really taken and I wrote this Bible study series on prayer. Uh, a few years back, we went through about, I don't know, 15 different prayers in the Bible that we walked through and studied in depth. And honestly, there's probably been no other Bible series, study series that I've put together that I I like just gleaned so much from and was changed by. And so I thought, well, if that's the case for a Bible study where we walk through, uh, only a handful of people actually walk through that Bible study with us. Let's turn this into a series. And so that's what we're going to do. We're not going to go through 15 prayers, but we are going to go through about seven in this series. So it's, it's going to be a little bit longer than a normal series. But we're going to look at seven different prayers throughout the Bible. We're going to look at prayers in the Old Testament that people actually prayed. We're going to look at prayers in the New Testament that people actually prayed. And we're going to look at some of the actual prayers Jesus taught and showed us how to pray. And so um, it's really going to be something that my pray just shapes our prayer life. Here's what I know about prayer. It, it's really an interesting thing in our lives because almost everybody who's ever existed in this world has prayed at some point in time in your life. Even if you don't believe in God, there's something that just happened that, you know, you, you may not even believe in God, you didn't, may not even believe in prayer, but you figure, well, what's, uh, I'm at the end of my rope. I mean, it can't hurt, right? So I'll just throw it out there, and if God hears, great. And so almost everyone really has experienced prayer. What's interesting, though, is, is that most Christians that I know still have this struggle with prayer. I mean, generally speaking, it doesn't matter where I'm at. If I ask the question, how many wish you had a better prayer life? Almost everybody would raise their hand, typically, uh, who are regular followers of Christ. They just, there's just something that they know, like, I could be better at this. Like, prayer could be a better part of my life, and it's just not. And so one of the things that complicates prayer honestly is we have a misunderstanding of what the purpose of prayer is and we also have really this wrong approach to prayer often we use it as a means to an end and what i mean by that is let me give you a couple examples people sometimes see prayer as something like penance okay and so when, when i say that you look at prayer as penance what do you do well you figure like if i get to a certain amount of prayers, and God is, has, I hit that magic number, God's going to finally answer that, right? So you keep praying about the same thing over and over. Sometimes we what? We call in reinforcements, right? So we get all these other people to be praying over the issue that we're going through, so hopefully we get to that magic number quicker. I mean, I mean really think about this. Uh, why, why do you invite people to pray with you over things that you're going through? You may never have looked at it that way, but why? Why do you ask people to pray and join you in prayer? Most people actually don't know the answer to that. They just know, well, it's better to have more people praying than, than not enough. We use terms like wrestling in prayer. Ever heard that term? We wrestled as if you could ever pin God down to get the answer you want, right? Like that, it's just, uh, it's this spiritual terminology that you probably even heard sermons on, wrestling with God in prayer, but they really trip you up in understanding what real prayer is. I could go on and on and on, but my point is, is that there's all kinds of really misunderstanding and flaws when we take our approach to prayer, and, and that actually keeps us from praying sometimes. It actually puts this barrier between us and God and when we come to God in prayer. That's why this series is honestly so important because it's going to really help us learn how to pray. It's going to do that because it's actually going to look at the different people in the Bible who have prayed and how do, how do they pray, uh, what is the content of their prayers, and what does the Bible teach us about prayer. Some of the concepts actually might surprise you in a way that's hard for you to accept. Because, listen, it can, it's, some of it's going to cut against the grain of everything you've ever been taught about prayer before in your life. I'm just going to say, that's okay. 
It really is. When, when, when you have something that just rubs you wrong, you're like, I just don't get that. Like, this is nothing like I've been taught before. That's okay, but just keep an open mind to what the Bible is going to teach us. That's the key. We're going to look at the scriptures and what the scriptures teach us about prayer. It's not just about what tradition has taught you or what somebody else has taught you. It's what the Bible has to say about this. And so let the word teach you, not your traditions. Listen, the scripture says this in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And so really our approach to prayer needs to be as we study scripture, God shows us what prayer really is. And, and he's going to be the one that shows us and reveals us to those truths. And what's really cool is, is that God often repeats the models he has in prayer of how he wants us to pray over and over again so that really as you see it, it's actually easy, easy to embrace. Uh, as long as we're willing to what? Ask, seek, knock, find. God says you're going to find his purposes for prayer for your life. If you're not going to give up, you're really going to seek. What does he have to say about this? You're going to find what his purpose is. Overall, my biggest intended purpose for this series is that each of us would find a greater and better prayer life as we walk out week after week from this series, that we are drawn to pray more. So today we're gonna to kick off our series by looking at the very first prayer in the Bible, which probably makes sense, right? If you wanna talk about prayer, go to the very first one. And yet at the same time, it might surprise you with what the first prayer is in the Bible, but it teaches us a lot about prayer. It teaches us also why it's complicated for our lives. The first prayer might surprise you in the sense that it's in, in the context of the garden. And it's in the context of actually the fall, okay? And so what we're gonna see here is, is what God does in prayer through the fall. But in this context of, of really the fall is, is really this comparison between what God intended prayer to be like and what it is for us now that the fall has taken place. And so the first prayer we see in the Bible is in Genesis 3, and we're gonna pick up in verse 8. It says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. For a moment, I want us to step back from the struggle to pray to look at what the prayer was before sin entered the world. From this passage, we see God seemed to come daily to have this walk with uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, in the cool of the day. In fact, that, that seems to be the pattern, okay? And one of the reasons why we say it seems to be the pattern is it, it doesn't say the cool of that day, it says the cool of the day. So that it seems to imply that daily this was a ritual that God had with Adam and Eve and he came and this was common. Listen, when Carrie and I first started dating, uh, one of the things that we did was we went for long walks and talks often. And we really enjoyed those. I, I actually still love those times. In fact, when we first started dating, I remember Sundays were sometimes crazy because I wouldn't see her often in the morning. And so I'd be somewhere at another church and then we would meet up and I would drive at least an hour to see her, to spend about an hour with her, to then drive about an hour to go to my job. <laughs> and it was worth every second to have those 60 minutes with her when we were dating. It, it was really something I thought was worth it. This is what prayer was like for Adam and Eve in the garden. Like God came to them and he shows up. They go for a walk and they talk and it's the most special time of the day for them. It was very important for them to have this standing meeting. And so what's sad is that most people have no connection to prayer being like this most important special time of the day when you get to meet with God. And, and it's something you look forward to, but it's actually supposed to be like that. That's what prayer is supposed to be like. The very first thing we need to understand about prayer is that it's simply this, it's conversation with God. And I know that that might sound simple, but this is really critical because I really think this is one of the stumbling blocks many Christians have in their prayer lives. We often miss that we get to talk with God. And he gets to talk with us. In fact, really, that is the most stunning part, that we get to talk with God. Do, do you realize, like, we have the audience of God and we get to talk to him. And that's what prayer really is. To set this up, let me talk about briefly how I pretty much started out praying as, as a kid, okay? So most of you know, like, I pretty much was born into a Christian home, grew up in the church, and, and always knew God was around. I, I actually very vividly, though, remember 
the b beginnings of, of actual prayer in my life. And it, it, my earliest memories of prayer happened around fourth grade. And it really happened in, in really an interesting scenario. It happened because I was part of a bowling league, and so my Christian school had a bowling alley in the basements. And so every, every Saturday, I would be bowling uh, in the basement. And so this is how my prayer life started. I, every time I got up to bowl, I prayed, God, give me a strike. And I'd bowl that ball down, and if I got a strike, I thanked God for it. If I didn't, I prayed, God, give me a spare. And I bowled that ball down, and whatever I got... I always thank God for it. And that was the extent of my prayer life was bowling. <laughs> Highly spiritual, right? And, uh, and so, listen, the, the, the challenging thing was is after a short period of time, it just seemed, seemed to make sense that when I walked to the bowling alley, which was about 10 blocks away from my house, I just started talking to God. You know, it was 10 blocks uphill to the bowling alley, and I talked to God on the way, and guess what that meant? On the way home, soon enough, I, I talked 10 blocks uphill back home, you know? <laughs> Some of you didn't get that. Yeah. Both ways were uphill. <laughs> That's in the back in the day when we actually used to use our legs and walk and stuff, so... <laughs> But there, there was this intense time where as I walked, I just talked with God. And then by 11, I had a paper route. And in my paper route, it just made sense that, hey, as I'm delivering papers, I'm just going to talk to God. And it just became this time where I'm walking the streets, I'm talking to God. And shortly after, I remember hearing God speak to me and tell me to go talk to those Jehovah's Witnesses who were walking two by two in our neighborhood. And, uh, and I went up and shared Jesus with them at 11 years old. Now listen, what, what I really began to experience and found out as I grew up is whenever I was alone, I wasn't alone. I wasn't alone at all. I was talking to God, and it shaped my whole life, and it's still shaping my life to this day. That I'm just talking to God as I'm doing life, and so much, it's not like this set aside times. And so prayer isn't meant to be a burden. It simply is supposed to be what's happening in our lives as we're walking with God. We walk with God and we talk with God. I think there's a song about that, right? I think many people struggle with prayer because they don't recognize that prayer is just talking with God. And we could talk to him about anything, whatever's going on. In fact, when the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing, some of us look at that and we're just like, wow, what a burden. <laughs> I gotta pray all the time. And, and we don't get that it's not meant to be a burden. It's actually an invitation that God gives us to do life with him 24-7. You see, 24-7, we have the opportunity to do life with God. And many of us, what we find is as we begin to invite God into every area of our lives is we're just simply talking to him about everything that we're going through. And guess what you find out suddenly happens? You're no longer doing life on your own all of a sudden. You're always doing life with God. That's what prayer is meant to do in our lives. But it's going, it happens moment by moment. Now, the second truth that we need to know about prayer is just as important, and that is, is prayer is always initiated by God. I know this can be more difficult for some of us to realize uh, because we have come to believe that prayer is trying to get God's attention on something, right? Right? So as I pray, I need God's attention because why? I need healing. So God, I need your attention on this specific area of my life. Or God, I need a job. So I need your attention to hit this area of my life. Or God, I need you to meet this personal need. Or God, give me strength to the day. And so, so often what prayer tends to be for you and I is getting God's attention. But listen, Jesus actually taught this about prayer. In the context of prayer, he taught this. And he says, we're not to babble with many words over what we need. And here's why. In Matthew 6, 8, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. And so people who know that verse, the question is, is then why do I need to pray, right? If God already knows, why do I need to pray? And I know some people who, who think that and they're like, well, I just don't pray anymore. God already knows what I need. So why take the time to pray if God already knows? Because our needs are what God uses to invite you and I to actually talk with him and do life together. It's our needs, our felt needs, that we suddenly are, have an opportunity in this invitation to now turn to God and say, God, this is what I'm going through, and express our hearts to God and to talk to him about it. What many of us don't realize is that prayer is always a response to God coming to us. 
It's actually why prayer is hard for people because they're trying to make prayer about going to God rather than a response to God coming to them. And if you're going to be the one that goes to God, it's going to be a struggle. So some of you say, well, wait a minute. I want God. I love God. I love being in his presence. Listen, when that is true, the reason that is true is because you have responded to God showing himself to you in prayer. And because you responded to him showing yourself in prayer, you love prayer. You, you love it, but God initiated it and you responded. And he's still initiating prayer because every time you pray and you love praying, you love praying because God is there. So you want what God offers you, and he has stirred that desire. So listen, we have to be very careful that we don't t think too highly of ourselves in prayer. It's a beautiful thing that you are not meant to be in the driver's seat when it comes to prayer. It actually is. Every one of us who's ever tried to take prayer seriously knows the extreme frustration that happens when you're praying and you hit a wall and you just don't know what to say anymore. And you just can't pray through, right? But if prayer is our response to God's leading, then what often happens in prayer is God leads you from one thing to the next to the next, and it becomes joyful. It becomes something that God is prompting in your heart to talk about it. The reason you and I often pray less is because we make it harder than it's supposed to be. And I just want to say this, any area of your spiritual life where you try to be in the driver's seat, where you try to do it because you're doing it, is going to turn into something filled with complete frustration. Do it God's way and with his power and what happens is, is there's joy that comes in uh, to your experiences of whatever it is that God is doing in your life. It's done with his power and his way and joy is there. And so as we walk through today, some of you I think are gonna have this light bulb that goes on and it's gonna be like, whoa, that's what prayer is about? Why, and, and you're gonna realize why prayer has been such a struggle in your life in the past, but you're also going to leave experiencing this desire and this new way of going, I'm gonna pray more this week and I'm gonna experience God more and more in every part of my day. And there's gonna be this joy that happens in your life. So let's get back to in Genesis 3, 8. Because remember, he comes before, before the fall, Adam and Eve hear God coming to them, and they look forward to this, right? They run to him, and they're excited to do, tell God about their day. But on this day, something different happened. God came like usual, but Adam and Eve didn't come like usual to meet them. Where are they? They're hiding from God. And it's really kind of funny when you think about it. They're hiding in God's garden that he created and he knows every square inch of that garden. And so they're hiding in what he created. And, and it's just kind of funny. John MacArthur says this about how foolish that, that is. He says, whatever he sees points back to God. He sees a tree, God created that tree. He sees a bush, God created that bush. He sees an animal, God created that animal. Whatever he hears points back to who? God. There's only one way, there's no escape from his presence. There's only one way to successfully flee from God, and that is actually to run to God. That's, that's what John MacArthur says, and I think that's so, so cool and so true in our lives. Yet, what does the world do? The world does the same thing, right? We hide from God in his own world, thinking like he doesn't know where we're at, right? And we pretend he doesn't exist, and like God can't see me, and yet everything around us is doing what? It's pointing back to there's a God, that there is a God who created all of this and we cannot get away from his presence. No matter where we go, there's God. And so God calls out to us with a question. He calls out to Adam and Eve with a question, but the Lord called to the man in verse nine, where are you? And it's a great question. Because if God is going to get our attention, we must first figure out where we're at, right, in life. Up to this point, Adam and Eve may not have even realized where they're at. Even that they're hiding, they're just busy trying to hide, right? And they don't realize where they're supposed to be until God says, where are you? Now I'm face to face with, hey, I'm supposed to be here, but I'm not, right? And, and we come to that realization. Every once in a while, there comes a spot in our lives where that question arises, where are you? And all of a sudden, we start really looking and, and we realize, I'm not where I hoped I would be by now. I'm not where I thought I would be by now. And yet, 
sometimes we don't realize that this is God trying to get our attention to be in where we're supposed to be in life. Where are you? It's a good question. It's important to understand that why why they're hiding in the first place. Adam actually tells them in verse 10, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. The reason Adam and Eve are hiding from God is because they're afraid of God that he's going to come and bring his judgment. They knew they had sinned. We don't know what time of the day they committed the sin, but listen, we know that there was enough time that they decided to sew some leaves together and make some garments to cover themselves up. We know they're hiding from each other. We know that when God comes looking for them, they found a hiding spot to hide out from God in the garden. They're hiding from God to try to preserve themselves from the wrath and punishment they knew they deserved from God. That's why they're hiding. They knew Genesis 2.17, God had said, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. Let's be clear here. God could have come and completely judged Adam and Eve in this moment and brought death to them. And they had every right to be afraid of God coming to do this very thing. But instead God calls out, where are you? Where are you? Did God not know when he calls out, where are you? Of course he did. He wasn't asking the question for his sake. He's asking the question for Adam's sake. And it's really our first glimpse of the gospel truth. What does God do? Jesus says in in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save what is lost. This is the heart of God. He knows they're lost. He knows they're hiding and they're lost from God. And God is coming to seek and save them. When it actually says God called to out to Adam, that Hebrew word for called means come and give an account of what's going on in your life. It's like, hey, I'm serving you the warrant. <laughs> now you have to give an account where you are in life. And so this is what God is doing. God is actually calling Adam for the opportunity to come and confess his sin. It's an invitation to repent. But instead of repenting, Adam hides from God. And this is why we so often hide from God. We know we've sinned. We know God is right in bringing us punishment. And so we're afraid of him. But listen, hiding is not repenting. There's a big difference. And people are good at hiding from God, but that's not repenting. Adam doesn't repent with the first question, so God digs a little deeper. He asks another question. And listen, remember this. Questions are invitations for you and I to enter now a dialogue with God. When God comes in and questions us, it's like, hey, let's reason together, right? That's where God says in in one of the places about our sins, let's come together and reason, okay? He, He brings us and he invites us in to talk about what's really going on in our lives because he's a relational God. But he said this, who told you you were naked? I mean, think about this. Adam and Eve up to this point have been naked the whole time. God created them that way. There's never been a problem. They've never felt shame. And all of a sudden, they think, this isn't normal. Like, being naked is weird. i got to put some clothes on. Who told them that they were naked? And the answer is no one did. No one did. Their shame rose up within them the moment they disobeyed God, and now their conscience has caused them to hide from each other and to hide from God. Now they're filled with shame, and it's because of their sin. And it's because of sin that you and I feel shame. Every one of us hides parts of who we are because we're afraid that if someone knows this about me, they're going to reject me. We hide our own sins, and we hide the sins that are done to us because we We think, if people knew this about me, they wouldn't really like me. And so we hide hoping no one ever finds out. Listen, while we can hide from each other, we can never hide from God. Psalm 139 tackles this whole subject. Sometimes read it. Okay, but generally, the psalmist asks this question in verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? And he spends this whole chapter answering that. And the summation is this. Nowhere. There's nowhere possible that you could actually go and hide from God because he's going to find you. 
And so this is the very truth. Who told you you were naked? Who, who brought that shame? You're not able to hide from God even though you try. And God actually doesn't even give Adam a chance to answer question two. He instead moves on to question three right away. And he says this, have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? God is using a technique that every parent knows when their kids just refuse to confess, right? I'm going to tell you, I already know what you did. You think I don't, but I'm just letting you know. And, and you would think, like, by telling him that, Adam would have just said, yes, God, I disobeyed. But what does Adam do? No, he's still not ready and willing to confess. Just like some of our kids, right? We, we've made it very clear. We already know, but nope, I didn't do it. And they're refusing and they're digging in to, to not confess. God basically put the words in his mouth, but he still can't even confess that I've sinned. Look at his response in verse 12. Then the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. I mean, I want you to think about what Adam's actually saying here. He's saying, God, you know, one night I went to bed, single, and I woke up married, missing a rib. I mean, out of all the women you could have picked, you picked this one for me. This is your fault. It's not even my fault. I didn't ask for her. You gave her to me. And he is what? He's saying, God, you're the problem in this whole sin issue. If you didn't do this, I wouldn't have a problem. Now, do you think Adam had some problems with Eve later on in life over this accusation? <laughs> but think about this. He actually has the audacity to blame his sins on God. That this is the whole reason. And yet, the truth is, and the reality is, is what? When God gave Eve to Adam, she was supposed to be his helpmate. He was supposed to be the leader. He was supposed to be the one that was in charge leading his family. And he, in, fact, in fact, when you look at the story, he was actually there the whole time. That the serpent was talking to Eve, and he could have stepped in at any moment and taken the lead and said, get out of here, I'm not. So he took willingly and ate of the fruit. Eve actually does the same thing. What does she do, though? She blames the serpent. And by blaming the serpent, she's basically saying, God, if you didn't let this snake into the garden, I wouldn't have been tempted. So once again, it is your fault that I ate of this fruit. In 24 hours, Adam and Eve went from praising God to blaming God for the mess they made out of their lives. Don't we see all, this all around us today? I mean, what do we do? We don't believe God. He doesn't exist. But the moment someone says, hey, you're a sinner, and this is what you're doing in your life, and it's a sin, we're like, well, God made me this way. It's his fault that I'm a sinner. Instead of owning up to our sin, we play the victim. And we'll blame everyone around us, including God, but ourselves. Sin is always like that. Sin always wants to justify ourselves. And one of the reasons why is because you and I actually, we love our sin more than we love God. Adam's not running to fall on the mercies of God. He's not doing that at all. He's actually trying to escape punishment that God rightfully has on him, yet at the same time hold on to his sin. He's trying to justify his sin and say, God, you're the one to blame, but he's not falling on the mercies of God. He's not running to God. He wants to hold on to that sin. That's what justification does. It's all about, I don't really need to change. God, you said it's wrong, but it's not. I'm saying it's right. And so it's right because I say it's right, but God, don't punish me. You have no right to punish me either. That's what justification does. And here's what's so sad, because there is no repentance between Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve will face God's judgment. They will face the consequences of their sins. And God will pronounce curses on their life from this day forward, and he will banish them from the garden. And the end result of justification for any one of us is that we face God's judgment. But thank God, it's really not the end of the story for our lives yet, while we still are living, right? As we close today, I want us to see that prayer is really God bringing us back to him, even in spite of our reluctance to run to him. 
Think about Adam and Eve. They, they're not willingly confessing their sins. They're trying to still hide from God. And yet, God is looking for them while they're hiding. They're not looking for God. That really describes many of our lives. We're hiding from God, and every once in a while, He just keeps showing up. And we just like, God, get away from me, right? Try and hide. And God keeps showing up anyways. Why? Because He loves us. God comes looking for us anyways, even though he knows what they've already done. He knows their sin. He knows how bad they are. And he knows that they don't even, they don't even want him at this point. And instead, God still comes and bridges the gap. Aren't you glad about that? Yes. That God comes and bridges this gap. God could have killed them. He could have abandoned them. And that wouldn't have been a good thing either, but he came to them inviting them back into a relationship with him. Even at the end of the day, when they rejected God, he gave them a promise. He gave the promise so that Adam heard this, Eve heard this, and so did the serpent. He says this in Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And what was it, there was a promise in this was there was going to be a complete restoration to our relationship with God someday. But in the meantime, God did something symbolic that was so powerful. In verse 21, it said, The Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. He kills an animal and he covers them with new clothes. And then, in other words, as he covers them, he forgives them. And so God forgives them and he gives them a promise and he sets in motion now a mission to bring us back to him. God is the one that initiated it all. And all that is left for you and I to do is then to respond. When God killed the animal and covered them up with the skin, it was symbolic of the Lamb of God that would be sacrificed on our behalf on the cross to take our sins away and to become our covering. In our righteousness, Isaiah says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in God, in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. It is God that comes in and actually covers us with his righteousness, with his clothes. Jesus often comes to us with the same questions. He says, where are you? Who told you that? And what have you done? And when God invites us into a dialogue with those questions, it's not to condemn us, but it's to bring us close to him so we can be clothed in his righteousness. At the end of the day, God's trying to bring us out of hiding and back into fellowship with him. That's what he's doing by asking us these questions. The question is, will we respond or will we keep running to a new hiding place? Many of us, we keep running to that new hiding place, thinking somehow God will go away. Listen, even then, he knows where we're at. The bigger question is, do we really know where we are? And even bigger than that, do you realize where you're supposed to be? See, God loves us enough to keep meeting us where we're at and probing our hearts so that we wake up to really begin to understand like God just wants to walk with us. He wants us walking in a relationship with him, talking to him and having fellowship with him. And when we realize that, we'll finally stop justifying our sins and we'll finally fall on the grace and the mercy of God. And it's in that moment of surrender that we actually experience the perfect love of the Father he has for us. Listen, 1 John 4, 18 is very clear. There's no fear in love, but perfect love. That God love drives out fear. Why? Because the fear that we have is about punishment. But when God is taking care of that punishment, no more fear. Some of us, we don't realize that the fear we have of God, the fear we have of praying, of being in his presence, is because we're holding on to sin and rejecting God. We're trying to justify ourselves, and we can never be justified in the presence of God. We can only be forgiven. And we need to find that. And so God is initiating a response in us. Hey, 
Will you repent? Will you respond to my gift of salvation? And if you do, we can start walking in fellowship again from this day on. And there's this invitation of repentance to walk back in a restored relationship with God, and it's a beautiful thing. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for what you are teaching us about prayer today, God. And Lord, many of us are here today, and, and prayer has been hard. But honestly, it's been hard because we're not responding to your questions. We're not responding to the things you're trying to get us to own up. Sometimes, Lord, we're just justifying our sins. And God, when we justify sin, there's always going to be a barrier between us and you, God. And I just pray that we would awaken to just how incredible it is that you come to us not to judge us, but to invite us into repentance. God, some of us, Lord, we need to wake up that we've been just running from one hiding place to the next, but the very spot we actually need is not to be afraid of you, but to fall on your grace and mercy because your perfect love will drive out every fear that we have of you, God. And so I pray right now in this room, God, that if there's anybody, Lord, who's been running from you, that today would be the moment that they would just surrender. God, we surrender all. And we thank you that you have searched us out even when we've hidden from you, God. Listen, if you're in this room today and, and you've never really just surrendered to God and you've you just know I've, I'm hiding. I keep hiding. But today you just sense and know like God is here and he is inviting you to repentance. And as you walk in that, you get to experience his robe, his covering, his salvation coming upon your life. And there is just joy in the presence of the Father from then on out. Would you just pray with me if that's you, you want to invite Jesus in your life. Jesus, we just come before you, God, and we just need you, Jesus. We confess our sins, God. And so often in the past, we've justified it and we've made excuses for it. We blamed everybody but ourselves, God. We've even blamed you many times. But God, today we recognize that we are not justified that we are the ones who have sinned. And yet, God, you're inviting me today to just repent. And Lord, call upon your name and I shall be saved. And I thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love that you don't give up. And Lord, today I finally just realize that, Lord, you're not trying to judge me, you're trying to love me. And so today I want to receive your grace, your mercy, and your love. And I thank you for that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.